All right, we're going. We're live. All right, cool. Right on. So, oh, 30 seconds late. Woo. All right. Um, thank you, everybody who's actually in the room and who's decided to stay for the last talk. I really appreciate you not like failing. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, if I had beer, I would be distributing it in in very high regard. Which this is good. A small crowd. We can shout a lot more. You're ne I'm never going to turn down beer. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I'm Vis. Today I'll be talking about mistakes, which is something I've seen practically never ever done on stage at any of these cons. Normally people talk about some amazing hack they did or some, some stuff about uh, how not to do this or how not to do that. This is specifically deliberate actions, deliberate mistakes, things that I've seen that were solvable for, with very simple very simple things that could be very pre preventable. And uh, I'll be talking about like effectively how not to infosec. So literally, this is a talk completely full of fail. Um, here's my obligatory about me slide. Um, if you want to stalk me on the internet, this is how I do some stuff, blah, anyway. Uh, everyone faces problems. And this is not unique or interesting. Oh, hey, beer. Thank you, sir. There's a story to that, but OK. Anyhow. Um, so several years ago, you guys may remember Adam Savage came to DEF CON and did a talk. It was a really amazing talk at DEF CON where he talked about how failure made him the man he was today and how you have to learn how to fail fast and move on and learn from your, from your mistakes, otherwise you repeat forever ad nauseum. Um, he failed fast uh, and it made him famous. Um, so taking effectively that philosophy to heart, I built this pres presentation to articulate sort of if-then conditionals for security problems where the then is effectively your company ends up in the news or gets hacked out of, you know, to oblivion or like, uh, was it DigiNotar or somebody like that got hacked so bad they had to go, they completely went out of business. So my goal here is effectively to help out by process of elimination, uh, which immediately made me think of one of these guys, which is a, a, a minesweeper that was built by a dude in Kabul, effectively out of bamboo sticks and little pieces of plastics. This thing gets carried around by the wind and runs over landmines and blows its legs off over and over again, which I thought, wow, how very apropos. So um, I figured this device was fairly inspirational, and I am using it as sort of my mascot for the talk. Let me be your minesweeper. Let, us, let me show you the fail. So first and foremost, I'd like to tell you a story, a hypothetical story, of course, uh, how overclassification and hiding of things and keeping of secrets is just hurting everyone. So imagine, uh, if you will, um, an FBI IT manager, a sheriff IT manager, a Fortune 500 IT manager, a DevOps like startup dude, and a pen tester all walk into a bar together. Everyone works for a big org that runs a Windows stack, uh, Active Directory Exchange, IIS, you know, the typical who's who. The pen tester asks, hey, did you guys hear about MS 15034, that new IIS denial of service vulnerability? And the DevOps guy says, yeah, we, yeah, totally. We're seeing well, hits coming in from China. Uh, Kibana and Logtash are doing a great job of showing us what's going on. We're having that pipe to mod security, and stuff's getting auto-dropped. It's really amazing. It's totally free. It's super scalable. You guys should totally look at it. Like, how, what are you guys seeing? Because, you know, this is us just in a little shop. You guys have a lot more reach. What's going on? The FBI, fold, FBI guy folds his arms and says, that's classified. Sheriff nervously folds his arms, looks at the FBI guy and said, what he said. Then the Fortune 500 IT manager says, ooh, uh, law enforcement's looking twitchy. Um, I better not say anything without um, um, on my attorney present. And the pen tester says, look, you, you guys are all in full disclosure. I see all your email headers. I know you're all running Outlook. I know you're all running Exchange. This isn't a fucking secret. What are you doing? Like, why? You're just, why? You're hurting everybody. Stop it. Um, so the entire time in the background, the SEA and the GOP are looting everything and hacking everything because nobody can agree on what they want to talk about because it's cool to have secrets and anyway. It's hurting things. Let's fix it. We're all on the same team. We should communicate. TLDR, stop. Um, so a list of companies from recent history that have had major, major, major security fails. Um, some of you may recognize some of these logos. Some of you have, may have seen the hilarity and, and that ensued on the Twitters. Um, these are giant public fails. Um, in the last five years, we've seen effectively more than doubling of these massive public breaches year over year. And the overwhelming majority of these problems were truly preventable. Everything from simple SQL injection to just looking at log files to storing data not in plain text, even as simple as having competent staff. Um, this isn't including doing intrusion detection or looking at egress traffic. This is just like the basics. Um, so here's one of these fancy graphs that I stole from somewhere, I forget where, that basically describes um, from 2015, or from 2013 to 2015, all the big major breaches that were reported, and that's the key, that's the big underlying, or the underlying statement here, that were reported. These are the ones that we know about, and the only reason we know about these is because people were getting their arms twisted to report breaches of public data. 
So for how many of these, you know, how many are there that we don't know about? So consider the following. Clearly, what we've been doing up until now isn't working as good as it could have. And uh, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. So we're getting better, but we're still getting hampered by various wet blankets. Um, and the following is going to be a compendium of specific examples of when something was done that dramatically and negatively affected security. These examples will be from a variety of perspectives, the pen tester, the IT department, the networking team, vendors, you name it. And again, the goal here is to show you what not to do in a specific given scenario. So we're first, we're going to begin with engineering fails, which is like the big public ones that we've seen. Um, lack of foresight, deliberate misconduct, charlatanism, when lawyers attack, reasons outside of security for why security isn't a consideration, and there are many. Sadly, I can't afford to if you issue everyone in the room a helmet. I really hope you have brought your own. So uh, with that, we will begin with deliberate SSL man in the middle, the, uh, the fun, fun um, superfish hack. Uh, if your organization decides that SSL man in the middle connections are, are cool and the argument is that it's for advertising or marketing or collecting user data as the security person in the room, it is your job to step in and say uh, that this is a really, really bad idea. Uh, some of you may remember an incident with a company called Superfish recently, which uh, the software was installed on Lenovo laptops and other branded laptops that uh, had, they had they built their own CA in and they were doing SSL man in the middle and capturing all the traffic for the sake of marketing. Um, Superfish claimed that it wasn't a big deal, but it turns out it really was. Uh, Superfish also didn't take into account that what would happen, or they didn't take into account what would happen if bad guys got a hold of their CA cert, uh, realizing that, hey, if I have the CA cert to like all of Lenovo's customers, I can very easily man in the middle every Lenovo customer. Uh, so that got really ugly very quickly. So lesson number one, don't invade people's privacy for monetary gain. Stop it if you can. Uh, if you can't stop it, make it very clear what these people are going to be doing is very bad news. And don't be surprised if your tech gets hijacked by bad guys to be used in evil ways because you didn't consider that you were enabling attackers to do evil stuff with your evil technology. Uh, so a while back, and this is a fairly old one, a lot of you probably are, are familiar with this, um, Sony had the genius idea of installing effectively malware on audio CDs that would install itself on people's computers when they put their audio CDs in the computers to listen to whatever it is they bought. Uh, it would install uh, backdoors that would track the user for DRM purposes and phone home intel about the user for Sony's marketing purposes. Um, if you ever sat in a meeting and somebody suggests something something like this, um, like installing malware on consumers' machines for the sole purpose of collecting data and doing marketing, um, <clears throat> as the security person in the room, hopefully you're in that room, uh, it's your duty as a security person to make sure that your uh, organization isn't violating anybody's rights, installing malware, or as the attorneys would put it, doing anything that would get us sued. Um, lesson two is very straightforward. Don't install malware on your customers' machines. Uh, so watching your users type on mobile devices and eavesdropping keystrokes also isn't very cool, no matter how you try to slice it. Uh, a while back, a company called Carrier IQ did this with Android phones in the same way that Superfish did this with the Lenovo's. They installed software at the factory before the phones were shipped out to the carriers that had uh, key loggers built on. And this was discovered by a researcher that noticed that every time he typed a single keystroke into his phone, uh, there was network traffic that was phoning home to some place reporting that specific keystroke. Um, so it turns out later that Carrier IQ is actually funded by a company that's a known CIA front for interesting research. So lesson number three, don't keylog your customers because when they find out, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, if I recall correctly, Carrier IQ is effectively shamed off the internet, but because they have unlimited budget, maybe they're still around. I haven't really looked. Um, so routinely folks in offices work, um, routinely folks in offices work in places that have password policies that they, they don't agree with. So people write down passwords on whiteboards or on sticky notes or on easy to find places, things like that. Uh, anything, um, that, another, well, it's usually easy to find. Uh, another really interesting he thing here that people don't tend to consider is their inboxes. People will email passwords to themselves. So, um, another, Great place in, in addition to the inbox is giant company file shares that are sort of like oceans that everyone can rewrite to. Uh, those are also typically not considered. People think, oh, it's there, it's company resources, it's got to be safe, right? Well, I can tell you as, uh, as the guy that gets hired to pen test those companies, that's one of the first places I look. I get into email boxes, I look at your sent items, I look at your, you know, I, the first thing I do is get in somewhere and do searches for password. So if you have a giant four terabyte share uh, that everyone can read right to, I'm going to get into it with somebody's credentials and do a search for password, and who knows, maybe I'll find like banking information, routing information. I found all sorts of ridiculous things. Um, 
Another, another huge problem is uh, organizations where they have like a welcome one, two, three style password or a change me password where um, the policy is, doesn't force the user to change the password after login. So you have like a password of Tuesday hash one. And then in 90 days when the policy says the password has to be changed, they just change the one to a two. So uh, you have this short list of potential passwords that exist for these types of companies and once you have that list, you can literally just brute force credentials using this known list of short office passwords and you'll get in every time. It's easily like a 30% saturation rate. Uh, on, on one specific example I can remember, which was really interesting, um, I got into the email box of one of the senior developers of this organization and he used Microsoft OneNote. I guess he was gonna be doing like a laptop upgrade or something because what this dude did was take all of his Microsoft OneNotes um, export them, put them in a zip file, and email them to himself. And then I got into his email. And all of his OneNotes were things like all the radius credentialing for their entire Cisco environment. So I had access to their, all their VoIP, all their switch fabric, everything, um, their NAS storage arrays, all of their development production equipment, the root passwords to all their servers. Like literally, literally this dude had the keys to the kingdom in a text file in his email. Um, so I got his password, and because I got his password, I got everything else. So um, your inbox isn't safe. Don't don't treat it like it's safe. Neither are big public file shares. Basically, if there's a clear text password somewhere, that's bad. Um, lesson number four: passwords are effectively like dick pics. Don't leave them lying around for people to find. Presume people will go looking for them. They they will. Trust me on this. And when they're found, you're going to be really embarrassed and you're going to have a bad time. So almost every company that I've done a red team engagement for, as well as Sony, has had, has had this similar plot problem, which I mentioned briefly on the last slide. Gigantic file shares open to everyone with no permissions of any kind. It's this giant sort of swap meet of, of uh, colorful things. Uh, gigs and gigs of juicy data, valid Active Directory credentials will get you there. Um, you can pull down gigs of data from these file shares and nobody will notice. Uh, personal stuff, bank transfers, faxes, scans of confidential documents, PII, personal backups, password files, database exports, pictures of other people's kids' birthday parties, um, personal backups, onboarding uh, uh, documentation, um, termination documentation, private keys, SSL data, the passwords to private SSL data, you name it. Everything is typically on these places. So as a security person in your organization, and, and this I know this is kind of a tall order because you're dealing with lots of departments and lots of different um, silos of influence, uh, you should call this out as a huge target for would-be attackers because believe me, I abuse this every chance I get. Uh, so lesson five, wrap your huge file shares with granular permissions. Trust me that you'll feel better about it. Uh, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look what happened to Sony. That's exactly what happened to them. Bad guys got in, they found, oh look, 12 terabytes of juicy, you know, zip star, copy off site, done. Sony's in the news. So make it harder for the bad guys, please. I know this one's a pain in the ass, but, but if you whine about it enough, you know, you get, you'll get you get the attention. Um, and this is, a, this is a really big one. Um, I've seen it in a lot of organizations. Uh, we'll probably touch on it later as well. Networking equipment that runs day-to-day -day at 90% CPU or 90% TCP session saturation rate. So some of you in the room may know what this means, but for the people that don't, let me explain. Networking gear, some, some networking gear, um, <coughs> Juniper, has a low ceiling for many concurrent TCP sessions. So running a, an nmap or something like that against a Juniper will cause it to choke because you're, you're, you're eating up all of those, all those TCP sessions. Um, when it reaches that session limit, it starts dropping TCP sessions. And when it starts dropping them, it doesn't just drop the new ones, it drops all of them. So SSH sessions drop, VoIP sessions, you know, uh, Samba mounts get unmounted, like the NAS breaks, the phones break, DNS breaks, shit goes sideways, it's bad. Um, so find these network engineers and shake them, just shake them. Um, um, it's, it's bad, connections die. So um, if you're in the networking group and you're knowingly let your, letting your gear run that hot, you should probably consider resigning. Um, you're putting the entire organization at risk on a daily basis. I understand budgets can be tough and hardware isn't cheap, but if, it's, if it goes down enough of the time, you're gonna be the one in the hot seat explaining to the management board or the board of directors or whoever why it is that you were comfortable letting these routers and switches run at 90% CPU and did nothing about it. Um, if, uh, if you're the security person and you find this in your organization, it will make your life a living hell. You won't be permitted to run any kind of security scans or any kind of auditing on these pieces of equipment because you'll come under, under, under scrutiny uh, from that group saying, oh no, you're gonna take our equipment down, which is a whole, a whole even scarier topic, which I'll get to. Lesson number six, if your firewall can't deal with a typical NMAP scan, get a new firewall. If your network engineers try to defend that position, 
uh, of running the gear at 90% saturation rate and somehow this is okay, get new network engineers. Um, so <laughs> to that end, this is another big one, and organizations that are deliberately running their equipment at 90% CPU and 90% TCP session saturation to purposefully and falsely claim that the gear is so sensitive that it can't be scanned by security or that nothing on the other side of the link is allowed to be scanned because it might take the firewall down. If you've experienced this in your organization, then you're in a kind of a precarious place because you're literally, you have one department between you and the ability of you to successfully complete your job. Um, so you have a whole segment of the network that you're responsible for, and if it gets owned, it's your ass, but you can't scan it because people are scared. Uh, so to, to GDED's point yesterday, like, you know, hold people accountable. If, if, if there are people that are preventing you from doing network scanning because of fear of taking networking equipment down, fix the networking equipment. If they refuse to fix the networking equipment, set them on fire and do it yourself. Or, you know, I'm not a lawyer, by the way. <laughs> that wasn't legal advice. If you set people on fire, tell them, tell them it was space rogue. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to wake you up. <laughs> um, so yeah, if, in that case, you're effectively up against people who are like career politicians. They are, they will fiercely defend themselves because their goal is to hide the fact that they don't know what they're doing in a lot of cases. And your security scanning and auditing will illuminate the fact that they don't know what they're doing. So they will do anything to keep you from conducting those scans because it's their ass at that point. So it turns very political. So lesson number seven, don't let the derp metastasize. If that cancer grows deep, it's nearly impossible to get rid of. Don't let underqualified people dictate how security works in your organization. Again, a tall order, but somebody has to say it. Um, so network segmentation is another really fun one. Um, I'm actually on a gig right now. I, I did this, which was pop a host on the internet and talk directly to the workstations from the host connected to the internet. Um, network segmentation is important. Uh, historically, networks were created with a strong perimeter and kind of a squishy nougat center. Uh, this was the way of the 90s, and if an attacker gained access to your land, then the attacker had free reign of everything on the land, since it was presumed if it's on the land, it must be safe. Sadly, networks are still designed that way, and um, almost on every assessment I've done, there has been some kind of poor network segmentation. Uh, and one particular comes to mind, all the network engineering folks sat on a particular floor on this building and quietly added their entire floor as subnet to a VLAN that allowed them to talk to production equipment directly. So you pop one host on that domain and now you have access past all their security infrastructure and you can talk to the production databases and production web servers. Like what's the point of having security if you're just gonna draw lines around it, right? Uh, so lesson number eight, do not trust hosts on the LAN just because they're on the LAN. Again, another oldie but goodie. Um, Password reuse is a really fun one, um, which get, has gotten interesting since the con, uh, inception and conception of Mimi Cats, if anybody knows what that is. Um, now, password reuse is a problem, you know, it's been a problem, and, and a lot of people were solving it by doing long passwords. Mimi Cats kind of helps the attacker in that case. Uh, for those not familiar with Mimi Cats, it permits the user to grab the plain text version of the Windows login password out of memory from a Windows box that somebody that has interactively logged into the machine, so like logging in locally or remote desktop. Um, it means that if your senior staff, if I can get your senior staff to run my bad stuff, I can Mimi catch their computers, take the 30 character ultra complex one password style passwords and copy paste them all over the place to log in all over your Active Directory network as senior staff. Uh, on one engagement, this is how I was able to jump from their main corporate um, infrastructure to their super secure production domain because all the domain admins were using the same exact password in both domains. Uh, I was li literally able to get full domain admin on more than three domains and all of the networking gear purely because like two dudes use the same password and all, all and everywhere. So lesson number nine, don't use the same passwords for Active Directory as all of your Cisco equipment or other domains because if those get compromised, then you have cross-contamination cross um, to other network segments and other, other pieces of equipment. Uh, so this, this, is a, this is a fun one, especially for finance folks. Um, I've seen this in a lot of financial companies, mostly financial companies, and I can't really figure out why. Um, the abject unwillingness to reboot anything for any reason whatsoever. Uh, usually uh, for the sake of counting uptime numbers because uh, old school culture is, or no, this current culture is um, overtly allergic to rebooting for any reason. And while not rebooting certainly helps with uptime, and you can have your like, oh, my box has been up for 3,000 days, ninjas. That's really cool, you're running kernel 2.2, have fun with that. Um, it tells attackers how old your hardware is, which greatly aids in breaking into those systems. So 15-year-old operating systems, Java and Flash from five years ago, antivirus that hasn't been updated since 2006, and the list gets longer and longer. Uh, the most recent occurrence, I saw, uh, recent occurrence of this I saw, I did, um, I, I, I was working for an organization that had 15 or so foundry switches as their core switching fabric. And 
Uh, they had our script run every night at midnight that would SSH into these switches and pull off configs, like you do, which is normal, that's fine. Uh, the trouble is that since they hadn't patched the switches in fucking four years, um, there was a memory leak that they weren't aware of, and the mem memory leak was triggered when you SSH'd in. So one day at five in the morning, I'm getting panicked phone calls because all of their switches went down at the same time, and they're, they're panicked. Uh, thinking that some attacker has deliberately taken down their network in a very specific and strategic way. To which the first place my mind went was, look, if you have bad guys in your LAN and they know that much about your network, they can take down your network at will, all of your switches, you have way bigger problems than your switches are down. Um, so the problem was that all of these all of these switches were rebooted at the same time, the last time that they were, the last time that they were bounced, they were, I guess, for a patch. And they hadn't been patched since. So their script that was SSHing into their switches to do the backups of the switches was tipping them over right after it, lo it logged out. So it would log into one, grab the grab the uh, the config, the switch would die. Then it would log in the next one, grab the config, the switch would die. Um, very sadly, I think those guys are still working there. Which <laughs> good luck to them. Um, so lesson number ten: stability is more than just uptime. Uptime. Please reboot your gear, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. Like apply patches, it's a thing. Um, so this is a fun one. Organizations that spend all of their man hours and budget on meticulously grooming office documents instead of actually conducting any kind of security whatsoever, usually for compliance and audit reasons, or mainly for compliance and audit, audit reasons. In a lot of cases, the compliance folks and the audit people will only look at that documentation and won't bother actually looking at the firewall. The example I always give is when like, you have a KPMG or Procter & Gamble or whoever rolls in and says, show me your firewall. They point to a box underneath a cube, underneath a cube and say, there it is, and they go, check, firewall in a box on the floor. Like, oh, look, my DLP solution is on the floor of the data center. It's not plugged into anything. It's just in a box. That's cool. You have it. Whatever. You, you're compliant. Good job. Right? Um, it, I have seen on multiple occasions entire, like, 10-person organizations do nothing but meticulously groom the office documents, Excel spreadsheets, Word documents. And the formatting, the font, and the bullet points seem to be more important than the fact that, like, hey, you have the GOP on your network right now, and they're looting the shit out of your environment. You might want to look at that. Right? Um, shops like that are typically why places like Security Reactions Tumblr exist, right? So lesson number 11, you actually have to do security for security to work. Um, nothing, none of that stuff actually ever happens in the MS Office suite ever. There never has there been an Excel, spree, Excel spreadsheet or an Office document that has fixed anything. Uh, it might make executives happy, it might make the auditors happy, but like the building is still on fire behind you. Um, no MS Word document or Excel spreadsheet has ever fixed a security posture problem, and none ever will. So, um, from time to time, security researchers will find something that they decide is significant. Uh, the good guy types will often contact the manufacturer of the hardware and, or software and notify them that there is some sort of critical vulnerability. Sometimes the vendor listens, and sometimes they don't. Uh, this is an example of when they don't. Um, there's a sign manufacturer, a little one, that makes giant LED billboards. Their configuration is basically a cradle point modem or some other consumer equipment that is connected to something, you know, on the internet, a Windows XP box and an Axis network camera. Um, there are holes poked in the firewall that permit access to the VNC server running on the XP desktop as well as the web interface for the camera. Now this company sets a bunch of default passwords, bad ones, really, really face-punchingly bad ones, and then hands the sign over to their customers who then put it up in front of a mall or in front of a, in front of a, um, a freeway or something to that effect. Uh, recently, and some of you may have heard about, heard about this, there was a, a, a sign in Georgia that got goat seed, and it was this same brand. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this particular story, this, where the screenshot comes from is um, a month before the hack, I emailed the company to say, hi, I'm Dan, I'm a security researcher, I found your signs, your passwords are terrible, oh my god, please let me help, because if somebody owns these signs in, in mass numbers, then it can get really, really ugly. And uh, the guy who wrote me back, this guy, Brian, um, he said, um, holy crap, um, this is pretty bad, let me put you in touch with the sign people, because the only guy to reach out to me from this company was a networking engineer that had nothing to do with the signs. He's like on the business side of the house. Well, the business side of that, or no, the, the business side of the house said, oh, you know, I'll send it over to the, the sign people. The sign people, I just got crickets, nothing, not a word. So a month later, I write them back and I said, hey, um, I'm still around. I'm, I'm, I'm offering free help. Like, please let me help. Like, this could get really ugly. Like, I can think of several dozen ways to make these signs behave in very, very, very evil ways that will make national news or like, you know, what happens if 300 signs light up and say that there's Ebola, right? Like, people will, people will poop. Um, so he wrote me back this, not interested, but thank you for the follow-up, to which I went rad, and I just immediately put it in the thought. So I should say for the record that this guy did try to help. He's just in the wrong department, which is unfortunate. It means that the, there's, or part of the company is aware of the problem, but the part of the company that needs to be aware of the problem 
is effectively ignoring it because at, 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 um, at this point, I was co started getting contacted by press and press was telling me that they have talked to the CEO already and the CEO says he doesn't care and that uh, I got contacted by at least half a dozen other security researchers who said, oh, you found this now? Cool. So I must mean like number seven or number eight in line here. Um, so lesson number 12, when a security researcher contacts your company and tells you about a problem, it means that not only does that one person know about the problem, but many, many, many other people know about the problem, they just haven't said anything. Uh, it's a really good idea, idea to take these folks seriously and at least listen to what they have to say, because usually what they're telling you is that your pants are down and you should see about pulling them back up. So uh, a giga did one time uh, for a company that had a SOC. Um, they had a moderately developed computer security program, and they had a SOC, a SIM, some security pre procedures in place. They were doing egress traffic filtering, so go on them. Um, uh, they, had a, they had a guy there who worked in the SOC that would look at the SIM, I think it was Curator at the time, um, and he would highlight 2,000 alerts and just delete them. So like 2,000 to 10,000 alerts, control A, delete. And then the room would burst into flames, figuratively speaking, of course, and people, oh my god, there's malware everywhere, where is it going, how's it phoning home, I think it passed all our security equipment. This genius over here just deleted all the evidence. Um, that made them angry. But um, I, should, me, I should say, me saying that this guy over here did it made them angry. The guy doing it, like, they didn't seem to care. They thought it was okay. Oh, I, I remember the manager being quoted as saying, I have bigger fish to fry. <laughs> you certainly will in the future. Um, I did start making the point that, um, that you know, maybe this guy's actually working with the bad guys, which then it turned political and went sideways very quickly. But uh, think about being the guy in charge of that particular situation. If you're a management in an organization and you're in charge of the security program and there's a member of your staff actively deleting forensic evidence that would help in the prosecution of people that are deliberately committing felonies against your organization, you might want to sit them down and say, like, dude, what are you doing? You're helping the bad guys. And if he doesn't know what he's doing, then you... Strap into a rocket and you shoot him into the sun. <laughs> um, yeah, because, oh my God, what are you doing? So, you know, lesson number 13, make sure your security staff knows that there are consequences to helping attackers. In situations like this, it's a good idea to make examples out of them, as mean as that sounds. Uh, if you're the director or the CISO, then you're going to be in the hot seat when you're faced with an angry board on why you keep getting owned. Like, imagine imagine if that was the case at Target or, or Home Depot. The CISO is going to sit down in front of the, the board of directors, and the board of directors is going to say, like, you got a dude on your staff that's deleting all your security alerts? Like, are you high? What are you doing? Get out. You're fired. So... Uh, specifically, you don't want to explain why one of your staff was actively deleting evidence that would normally be used to find bad, guy, bad guys that are committing felonies. So, important one. Ah, now the fun part. We switch to the pen tester side of the house. So that was all engineering. That was all, you know, networking, sysadmins, right? So this is like what a lot of us in this room presumably do. Uh, we move on to the part where we talk about attackers failing very hard. It's easy to talk smack about client fails and huge public engineering fails from the point of view of an attacker, but make no mistake, the attackers have lots of derp too. They have quite a lot of derp. Let me play you the song of my people. So, uh, as it turns out, using mass scan on a client probably isn't a good idea if you have it wrenched all the way up. <laughs> firewalls that have deep packet inspection turned on or other next generation firewalls that have a bunch of bells and whistles turned on literally never take into account that the firewall is going to get scanned from time to time uh, and it, it's not always going to get scanned by the good guys. So it's funny for the folks in the room that remember when Sin Cookies started making it into the Linux. Hello, I'm Geek here. Unfortunately, the video software kind of crashed, and we lost the live footage up until about the 33-minute mark. But if you fast-forward to there, you'll be able to hear the rest of Dan's talk. But you can see the slides in the meantime. Sorry for the problems.
InfoSec, he approached the school and said something like, I found you guys have this huge problem and I have the solution, but I'm not going to give it to you unless you pay me. To which I believe they responded, I think that's called blackmail. Uh, I forget the exact details, it was several years ago, I don't remember what happened, but I think the police were involved and, and he had a very bad time. So lesson 19, words mean things. Really, they really do, no matter how much you flaunt your disregard for the English language, the rest of us actually use it. Please be precise with your words, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. So the really fun part about doing a tax simulation is the part where you get to, uh, you have a letter, a physical letter absolving you of any crimes against the organization because you're permitted by executive management to do this sort of stuff. You have permission to attack as an adversary, adversary would. Generally these things are on site kind of deals. It's a get out of jail free card you keep in your back pocket for when the cops show up because the security guard called the cop, cop, cops on you when he saw you trying to lock pick the back door. Yeah, the cops show up, you give them that and you don't actually go to prison. Um, in smaller engagements like external network pen tests or web app pen tests, you really don't need a letter because you're not physically there and security guard can't call the cops on you. Um, you typically, in some cases, get like your, your home IP or your work IP or whatever it is whitelisted so that uh, the application that needs testing can get tested and the IDS doesn't interfere. Um, in pen tests, or pen tests are typically supposed to be semi-exhaustive where red team engagements are supposed to be stealthy and uh, narrow and deep. Uh, but when doing any kind of this work, staying in scope is generally a really good idea. Uh, I heard a story recently about a guy who decided to go way, way, way off reservation on a web application pen test. Uh, he believed that he wasn't doing so well on the web app pen test and decided he would give the customer some extra value by doing a social engineering <clears throat> attack on them as well. A non-sanctioned, unknown social engineering attack that compromised users. So when the client called the business and said, hey, I think we're getting attacked right now, he stood up and took credit and said, yep, that's me, I'm doing that. Um, I wanted to give you some extra value because I wasn't getting anywhere with the pen test. To which they said, felony! And he had a bad time. I believe he was fired on the spot um, and it got ugly for this, for this guy. But uh, lesson 20, scope is important, especially on engagements where only few people know that you're coming. Give the customer what they wanted and what they paid for and nothing else. Anything extra in this case is like your stylist giving you extra free work during a haircut. It'll just leave you really pissed off. So uh, it's pretty routine to see attorneys get involved with rewriting and reviewing statements of work and legal contracts and things like that when involved with these engagements. The pitfall here you can get into is if the attorneys realize they can wedge themselves into the process and charge extra hours by wordsmithing and, and demanding, um, analyzing the documents over and over again, um, they, they will, they will cause scenarios that require them to be needed more. Uh, specifically, if you find that your statement of work for a pen test magically now includes incident response and remediation work after the attorney reviewed it, where that was never discussed previously and they just basically added like a quarter million dollars of work onto the, onto the statement of work and didn't tell anybody, um, it's something you should probably watch out for. Um, in those circumstances, you have to call it out and make it absolutely clear, like you know, this is a pen test gig, or this is a red team gig, this is not a remediation gig, we're not being paid to fix the problems after the fact. That's a separate statement of work, sure, but it's not this one. Thank you for trying to add it, you know, and, and not tell us anything about it. Um, they will also try to change, and this is one of the important pieces of information, they will try to change the language in the statement of work to protect the company from themselves um, from the guys that I've mentioned before that will run all the networking equipment at 90% CPU and 90% TCP saturation limits because they will say things like, if you, if you knock our network over during your initial discovery scans, uh, you are responsible for that, to which you have to say, well, no, 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 uh, this is your networking gear and what we're doing is not invasive and not destructive. If your networking equipment can't handle an NMAP scan from the internet over like a 45 megabit pipe, you should probably consider networking gear. Or we can wait, you know, to start this engagement until um, we all finish our little voodoo dance in the parking lot with your um, engineering department on fire. Um, so they will protect the network derps. Uh, and they will try and put you at fault if, if the network derps make a mistake and you're, you're breathing on it incorrectly causes a problem. So lesson number 21, if attorneys are involved, put on your eagle eye goggles uh, when reading the documentation after it's been through the attorneys um, because they are allowed to edit it in some cases and it's not uncommon for them to just wedge something in there and hope that you don't notice. So be very careful. Um, so now that we have something like 21 landmines that I've pointed out, let's talk about what happens if you actually step on one. So if your organization has a huge failure and it's not in the news yet, you want to get out in front of it, uh, there's a lot of different ways to keep it quiet or at least lessen the blow. If customer data was leaked, then in a lot of cases you're legally obligated to disclose that there was a breach. If there was no customer data leaked, then you're not legally obligated to disclose. And this can go uh, several different ways. One, you can try and hide it, the news will find out, and then they will call you out on it and you're going to have a bad time. 
Two, you can cop to it, but if you do, don't lie about your capabilities. Um, the public would rather hear, yes, we got breached, yes, we know we did something wrong, and we're fixing it, stay tuned. Um, for an update you know, on what we're going to do to improve our security posture, uh, but then you're actually on the hook to deliver. If you can't make a statement like that, you can't make a statement like that and then not deliver. Otherwise, uh, you'll likely become a target again. Look at Sony. If I had to guess, I would say that Home Depot and Target are also being attacked because of their lackluster public responses to breaches. Don't make yourselves a target by lying to the press. Uh, don't talk about the press. Don't talk to the press and you can, unless you can legitimately say something reassuring. Bland corporate statements will just tell attackers that you do the bare minimum and that companies that only, uh, and that companies that do only the bare minimum will just continue getting attacked over and over again because it's a cycle. You do nothing, you get owned, then you do more nothing and you keep getting owned. This is probably one of the reasons why Sony has been up and down. Um, so in most large corporations, there is a PR person or PR department who does all the interfacing with the press. Do your best to arm that person with the proper nomenclature to not sound like an imbecile on camera. Uh, to better, uh, the better these folks look, the better you look, by proxy, they are the public face of your incident response. Take them to cons, teach them to pick locks, make sure that they are aware that hackers aren't scary and that we're friendly people. They will have your back and they will take the time to get it right. So make sure you have a good relationship with your PR team if you're doing incident response or you're, you're kind of somewhere in the middle management or upper management in your organization. It's, this, this will help you if the shit ever hits the fan. So attitude does count for quite a bit. And most, most large organizations, um, uh, you have a lot of emotional sort of, not strife, but emotions run high when people are getting owned. Um, you're going to be running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Um, you're going to be pressed for details. You're going to be pressed for updates. You're going to be pressed to fix things on the spot. Uh, bad guys are exfiltrating data, and people are trying to tear you in three, 10, 15 different directions. If you maintain a good attitude, even if you're faking it, then um, things will go by quicker, and it will cause the tension to not be quite as bad. So something to consider for the future if uh, next time you have to deal with IR and maybe there's press involved, keep a cool head, you'll, you'll thank yourself about it. So if you know you've been breached and you have a company blog, you'll want to issue periodic updates on how you're doing to remediate the problem or how you're dealing with, um, like in a lot of cases, when you have credit, credit card fraud, you want to talk about things you're doing to help protect the consumer after the fact uh, if customer data has been touched. Um, it's pointless to issue hollow or empty bland corporate statements that mean nothing. If you want to avert the press digging into something that you said vaguely to try to hide the truth, uh, you want to make sure that when you give the public what is reasonable to believe, um, way before they have to actually ask for it. Because if you tell them what they want to hear, um, what will be comforting before they ask, then they are less likely to actually continue asking because you have set the expectation that you're going to tell them stuff before they actually ask for stuff. So this is good. Um, they will think that you're on top of it, and that's where you want to be. So have a plan for when something breaks. Uh, I know this is sort of a disaster recovery or incident response plan, but even then, just like, Four or five bullet points on a bar napkin, like anything. Uh, a lot of organizations that I've talked to really don't have any kind of plan. They have they have a lot of vague business language in a document, but none of it's really actionable. Like you can't, it doesn't tell you what to do when shit hits the fan. Uh, take the time to come up with scenarios for what would happen if, and sort of play the part of the bad guy. Have a written planning plan for when your ops team uh, needs uh, something to follow in case something bad happens. Uh, it doesn't even have to be formalized, doesn't have to be a real incident response plan. That's been wordsmith for corporate consumption or anything like that. It could even be just, just a bullet point list on a bar napkin for stuff to consider or, or even places to look for indicators. Um, preparing even just a little bit goes a very, very long way during incident response. So uh, as I've mentioned, uh, during a breach, nerves will get frayed, people will get stressed, uh, they'll be shouting in panic, uh, people will inter interrupt you with questions and demands for status updates, and during all of this you'll be pressured and you'll be suffering some level of anxiety. Uh, it helps to have some sources to look up findings. Here's a great one. Sadly, I didn't put it in the slide because I'm an idiot. Intel.criticalstack.com. Uh, I think it's maintained by the Bro guys, and the Bro guys have all these awesome sensors. It's like 800,000 sensor sources that you can pipe in. So um, if you have no IDS, you have no interesting stuff, you can you can boot Security Onion on a live CD or on a VM, and you can plug this you know Intel.criticalstack into your Bro feed in Security Onion and go from zero to something. Uh, to which you can start detecting if some bad guy is doing some bad stuff on your network. Uh, if nothing else, start looking at firewall logs for outbound traffic on ports that your organization doesn't use, and to countries your organization doesn't do business with. Uh, if you have neither of those pieces of data in place, then getting something like Security Onion stood up ASAP to listen to a tap port or switch port uh, will help dramatically. So with that being said, uh, here is the TLDR on the entire talk. 
Uh, here are the landmines that I have, I have found and others have found and clients have found. Um, and thankfully, I have a little extra time. Um, if anybody has any questions or hate mail or wants to throw a knife or something else, um, I'm opening the floor. Questions, comments? Yes. <laughs> so the question was, um, uh, what do you do? What do you do when you encounter um, graybeard elder god types that are in the network land that say, "I know better than you. You're dumb. Like I'm not going to listen to you." Uh, I actually experienced this at that at one, the client with the switches. Um, I was able to access all of their file shares, like 12 terabytes or something to that effect, of all their data from their guest wireless network across the street on the park, you know, in, the, in the parking lot. And uh, when I told him, when I told the head of networking about it, he said, you're not supposed to be able to do that. And I said, yeah, that's the point. Um, so he believed, this guy believed that there were ACLs in place. And um, uh, the only way that I was able to actually get the point across to him was to walk up to his desk unannounced without setting a meeting. The interesting, interesting um, uh, thing you've reminded me of with this particular topic is if you try and set a meeting with these people, they will purposefully deny the meeting and they will schedule other meetings during the same time to make sure that they can't they're avoiding you, and they're doing it using Outlook. Um, so just walk up to their desk and plunk your laptop down and hit enter and be like, hey, look, I've just loaded a bunch of uh, uh, wire transfer uh, PDFs, like this one right here is for $500,000, and it's got the board signatures on it. How did I get this? And he'll say, oh, well, you know, you can just, blend. and as he's talking, just ignore what he's saying and show him that you're on the guest Wi-Fi. And after he, he's done shitting his pants, maybe he'll do something about it. But in my experience, later that day, the ACLs magically appeared quietly, and there was no tickets, there was no, no glory, nobody got credit. Like, the problem was fixed, but like, nobody got credit for it, didn't make it in any docs, it was just like, oh, it was always like this. Go ahead. Taunt me into a blind scan? Um, I've had blind scans. Oh, so the question was, has a client ever taunted me into doing a blind scan and then have it, have it actually have been in scope? Um, no, I, I have been asked to scan infrastructure that I'm, not, that I'm unaware of. Like, for example, a lot of my gigs, we do what we call a tax simulation where we don't get anything from the client. All we have is just their, their company name. So it's things like looking on bgp.he.net to find out where all their AS, ASs are and like, what their network space is, look, at, look them up on Aaron, find them on Shodan, um, see if you can find, like, find SSH keys on their perimeter and then see if you can compare SSH keys from there to SSH keys in like DigitalOcean and EC2 to see if they have boxes that are sharing host keys on the internet or something like that. Um, it's a lot of perimeter discovery, but no, I've never actually been like bait and switched into port scanning, something like that. I'm immune from that. Immune to port scans. Good luck with that. <laughs> Anybody else? Questions? Questions? No? Yes? Well, um, it looks like I gave you back 13 minutes of your life. Thank you very much for allowing me to come on stage and berate you guys. <laughs> <laughs>